Hello, welcome back to another episode of In the Stacks by the Sea. I'm your host, Dan Turner, and we're here at the Waccamaw Library, part of the Georgetown County Library System in wonderful Litchfield, South Carolina, by the beach, in the stacks. And we have a delightful guest with us today, Dr. Sarah E. Gardner. Uh, she is a remarkably prolific, highly respected scholar who studies the intellectual and cultural history of the American South. Uh, and she just gave a wonderful talk uh, that was uh, in our FOWL, Friends of the Waccamaw Library, first Thursday series, although we had to move it, thanks to <laughs> Hurricane Dorian, to a third Thursday, but uh, it's first Thursday series, and um, her talk today, What the Dickens Were Civil War Soldiers Reading, or Soldiers Who Like Hugo at Bull Run, Also Like Poe at Chickamauga. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Gardner is Distinguished University Professor of History at Mercer University, and so we're delighted to have her Thank with you. us today. Welcome, Sarah, to In the Stacks, By the Sea. Well, thank you. Stacks and delighted to be here. Yes. So, just a point of clarification before we get going. Uh, mm -hmm. You're Distinguished University Professor of History at Mercer University in Georgia. Uh, distinguished is just a figure of speech, <laughs> right. correct? Yeah, I think it's because I'm old. Uh, so, yeah, it <laughs> just means old. Right. Yeah, gray-haired, mostly. Okay. Just goes with the title. It's not actually a, you don't have to be distinguished, like reverend, people call reverends. Just goes with <laughs> That's right. the phrasing. Okay. Just wanted to clear that up <laughs> ahead of time. All right. Well, can you say... A little bit. It was a wonderful talk you just gave, and we, uh, Heather Pelham, our delightful and uh, terrific public services librarian, mm -hmm. uh, filmed the talk for us, so it'll be available online soon. Uh, but she, you just gave that talk. Can you say a bit about what the Dickens Civil War soldiers were reading when they were in the field? Yeah, okay, so when they were in the field, they weren't doing a whole lot of reading. Right, um, scripture maybe, and usually at night before they went to bed. Yeah. Um, many, 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 many soldiers tried to keep up reading scripture. Um, in the camp, they might try to do it on Sundays, but in the field, they would read it in the evening. But <clears throat> battle does not necessarily lend itself okay. um, to reading much during the fighting. Mm. Right, so. Um, you, you, you did well if you were able to cram in a couple of verses from scripture at the end of the day. Maybe. If you were saber fighting or <laughs> bayoneting, you could, yeah. or pistol, you could read. Well, there's lots Depending of, how devoted you were to reading. Lots of testimony, some, some of it definitely apocryphal of soldiers who carried books with them in their, in their breast pockets and mm. were saved because the book had blocked the bullet yeah. uh, from, from hitting them. So. Usually, it, it's it's the Bible, or it, if you're a Confederate, it's Augusta Jane Evans's novel Macaria that blocked the bullet from ah. killing from killing the soldier. So, okay, yeah. good good thick words. Yeah, but they're 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 mostly reading, mostly doing most of their reading in camp. In camp, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. Um, so, when they were reading in camp, what sorts of what what were the most popular fair that they were reading? Very few American authors um, of the Boston literati, Hawthorne would be the most popular mm -hmm. um, amongst those, but they would read earlier American authors like Cooper, um, William Gilmore Sims, um, Irving, Poe's poetry, not his stories, which they thought a bit morbid. Yeah, pretty bloody. Pretty when morbid. You're in the like in one, the field. His, his mind seems to be deranged, right? So they they read poetry, but not but not as yes. novels. So what they were reading, popular, domestic British novels, mm -hmm. and and sort of as they came out. 
hot so off the hot off hot off the presses. Uh, they wanted okay. to keep current, and so th that's what they were reading: Charles Dickens and uh, Trollope and Thackeray. Wilkie Collins. Wilkie Collins. Loved, they yeah. loved Wilkie Collins, and I recommend Wilkie Collins. Yeah. Woman in White. It's a good read. Classic, and a, and a pretty good film, an old movie too. I might I might add. Um, yeah. So these. Why, why do you think they were so entranced with British uh, novels as opposed to American? Probably because that is what they were familiar with reading. Um, and a lot of that has to do with supply. We're all familiar. This is, you know, this is one of those things that, that northern authors complained about. Um, so one, uh, they hadn't developed a full body of novels yet, right? We were coming into the age of the novel in America, so they hadn't there just isn't as much available, um, plenty available, but but not as much as what they can get from the Brits. But it also has to do with copyright law. So one, ask Charles Dickens. You did not have to pay Charles Dickens royalties if you printed in the United States. So that's free uh, game. You just need to take it, re reset it, and sell it under an American imprint, and it's free. American authors, you had to pay royalties okay. too. So better for, for publishers, it's best to publish, to reissue British novels. And because Americans read British novels before the war, that's what they wanted to continue to read. Okay, so that, it goes back to, to the money and the distribution It goes distribution back to copyright and, and distribution and, and, and what's wow. available. And again, there, there's enough, you know, American romance novels, but, you know, these were folks who were just used to reading British authors. Yeah, okay. Um, and how many, you're a historian, how many soldiers died in the U.S. Civil War? Uh, the numbers keep getting ratcheted up. So really? when I was in graduate school a million years ago, the estimate was about 620,000, give or take. Now we're up to about 700,000, really? uh, 750,000, somewhere around there, up to about three quarters of a million. So it's a pretty significant chunk, um, relatively speaking. Are those just the MIAs that are being discovered? And re recalibration, yeah. re more sophisticated methods of, of counting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, was, so it, a lot of people. <laughs> just checking on Wikipedia to yeah. make it's sure a, that, right, you're gonna, the accuracy yeah. of that. But Remember when he said okay. I'm a cultural and intellectual historian? I do All that right. so I don't have to count things, except maybe books. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll get back to that, and we'll edit it. We'll oh. edit it out if oh, that's good. for accuracy. But according to you, so we really don't know. It could be anywhere. I think we have a pretty good idea. Maybe a million. We have a pretty good idea between five hundred thousand and a million. So. Pretty wild. But how many of those do you think were reading-related deaths? <laughs> I've you had yet to. Guess. I've yet to come across an account of a soldier who was picked off while reading. While reading, okay. It, but you know what? I, it could it happen. happen. Um, might be reading in a nook of a tree branch or something like that, right? And and uh, fall out of a tree? That I suppose that's possible could happen. too, but I've, I've, again, not come a across it. A series of really bad just doesn't, paper cuts. <laughs> just doesn't. And just kept that's right. feverishly reading. It doesn't mean reading. it didn't happen that, yep, sure. Okay. Well, we, you know, we did, there is that famous, uh, the famous saw by Mark Twain, who blamed the Civil War on uh, on Sir Walter Scott, mm -hmm. because the idea is that he wrote all these uh, these great uh, uh, these novels that were medieval novels praising chivalry, and that inspired the Southerners with mm -hmm. these these big ideas, romantic ideals, and you know. They got that in their hearts and rushed off and, to war and ran with it. Yeah. Yep. So, so you know, what do you what do you think about that that notion? Uh, it's a lovely formulation. If I remember correctly, he says something like Scott and all of his chivalry doings is how yes. he phrases it. Right. This is just complete bunk that the South swallowed, hook, line, and sinker. Um, Northerners read Scott just as avidly as Southerners did, um, and in, in the late nineteen. 19th, the late 1850s, um, 
Tickner and Fields reissues all of Scott's novels for a northern reading audience and a like deluxe yeah. library kind of edition. And you don't do that if you don't think you're going to have readers. Um, so northerners read, read Scott, um, maybe in not maybe not in quite the same ways. But I have one soldier who loved Scott and writes his sister home as the war is ending, and he says these days are over. I wish I could read Scott. I wish mm -hmm. I could ride my horse, um, but those days are gone. So um, I'm not saying Scott doesn't inform what post-war writers, Southern post-war writers were doing, at least of a certain kind of writing, um, but Scott wasn't something that only Southerners read. You can read Scott a lot of different ways. Yeah. Frederick Douglass took his name. Douglass comes from Lady in the Lady in the Lake. Is that the, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And so there so there's a re and there's a reason why. Yeah. Um, because a lot of Scott is about search for patrimony, right? And here's Frederick Douglass. So you get a lot of lessons that one can take from yeah. one can take from Scott. Um, but it's a lovely quip and one yeah. that one that uh, it, gets used a lot. Just it, yeah. It has that, you know, it has that uh, that soundbite quality to mm -hmm. it, but uh, the story is obviously much more complex, and um, if it's accurate at all. And you know, another point you made that uh, Union soldiers is, were reading a lot of the same materials as the Confederate soldiers. Maybe not Augusta Jane Jane Evans, well, Evans yeah. as much, but maybe. Uh, yeah, story. You know, all those stories that that was that was banned and yeah. banned in the Union. Um, so now I can't say I've found a lot of Union soldiers or, or civilians reading Macaria, but um, by and large, they're all, they're all reading the yeah. same thing. I noticed very little difference between Northerners and Southerners, between men and women, and between com combatants and civilians. They are yeah. all reading, by and large, the same material. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, in the, obviously, Union soldiers reading, they, they would read, some would read, abolitionist tracks yes. and things like that. But, right. Uh, uh, and so would civilians. I found yes. um, library records that tell me, you know, that civilians are checking out Frederick Douglass's yeah. My Bondage and My Freedom or Frederick Law Olmsted's Slavery on the Seaboard States. And so that's not going to be popular fare in the South? No. Yes. No, that's not, not, as, mm -mm. not as, yeah, not little, down the reading list. Down the reading little, list. A couple read Uncle Tom's Cabin to sort of know what mm. the enemy is doing, but not, not the way one would read a novel for yeah. other reasons. Um, and that, in a lot of your talk, we, we've talked about what, you know, what they were reading, what the Dickens, but really your talk was mainly pitched at uh, how and why soldiers were reading. And could you say a little bit about both those, both those facets? Yeah, so I, th you know, part of what I'm interested in is how soldiers and civilians navigated navigated through conflict. And so one of the habits that they were used to, one of the intellectual and emotional uh, attachments that they had before the war was reading, so they continue to read while in camp as a way to sort of hold on to something that, that they knew um, and something that they enjoyed, all right? And so it's a way to m maintain connection. So families are separated. Um, I might be able to t tell you about what's happening in battle, and soldiers do that, but maybe we could talk about books so I don't have to talk about what I saw yeah. in, in battle. So maybe maybe we could read the same thing. I see a lot of soldiers saying, let's try, sort of like, let's try to pick a book, or let's try to read this part from Scripture at the same time so that I know that when I'm reading this, you're reading it too. And maybe you'll think of me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, so, it, and it becomes, it's in, we think of reading today, you made this point as a very, um, uh, it's an intimate experience, and it was, I think, back mm -hmm. then too, but it, we think of it as very individual and isolated, but uh, you were arguing something distinct back then. It was, it had that communal or a, a connective, more, maybe more of a connective uh, experience. Yeah, too. social reading, right? So social. families would read aloud to each other. Um, if you were uh, if women on the home front would read and there was always someone who was reading out loud while the other women are sewing and then you would you know take t trade places yeah. um, so something that was going on in the background while you were while you were doing war work soldiers in camp would read out loud Dickens 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 all the time Dickens um, but but other other things as well and you and I think that's why you see in the letters I wish I could read this with you 
Yeah. Um, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transcribe all these passages <laughs> so, that, so that you can read them, so you can have yeah. a sense of what I'm reading. And I'll bring the, we'll read it together when I get home um, because I want to recreate that family dynamic in, in some cases. Sometimes they hated reading aloud, but in most cases not. And, it's, and Dickens is all about the family, even when there are all kinds of threats to the family, it's mm -hmm. the family is what matters at the end of the day in Dickens. And so that's part of why they loved him so much and, uh, and the soldiers in camp and they were longing for that. And you, you also made the point that this was something that they were, they're longing for, They having read Dickens before mm -hmm. at home with their family, so it's kind of reenacting that that nostalgic experience. Yep, they and they, they will sometimes write home, but it's not quite the same, right? It's not quite the yeah. same reading it with your buddies in camp, right? They wish they were with their family members, but y y again, needs must. You do, you, you do what you need to do. Yeah. Um, Christmas story. A Christmas story, every, like, right? You just yeah. keep rereading that because that's what you had, that's what you had done. So that's yeah. one, of the, one of the, they're all popular, but that one comes up a lot. Yeah. Um. And uh, yeah, so we've got uh, we got Dickens, the family. Uh, you mentioned Wilkie Collins, and mm -hmm. what what do you think explained the allure of Wilkie Collins? Yeah, first of all, it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. in my in my humble opinion, um, I think part of what Wilkie Collins allows soldiers and civilians to see, it's, it's, it's a detective story, right? And we're trying to figure out what happened to this woman. So, and it's all done by reason and logic. And what, it also has a satisfying end. Mm -hmm. um, if, you want, if you want some kind of ending that's, um, where there's resolution and the family remains intact, you're gonna get that in Wilkie Collins, yeah. even though you're not so sure when, when you first begin it. Although they're familiar with genre, and they know domestic novels do not end in bloodshed, right? So that's one reason why they turn to them. We all know that there's genre conventions, and you read particular genres because you enjoy those conventions. Right. So something like Wilkie Collins, reason and logic apply even when something awful is happening. So there, right. I think, is a kind of appeal to reason and logic prevailing in the midst of conflict and chaos. Right. Um, so uh, one one soldier um, liked Collins, but he also read, read Eugène Sue's Mysteries of Paris, which is a kind of like a police novel that's a thousand pages long. Wow. I think in the Penguin edition, it's two volumes. It's so it's so thick, and he's just like have to carry this damn book around. I'm still not finished with it, right? He's like, oh my god, I'm going to finish it. And he, you know, yeah. it's it, it's kind of a labor, but um, but he enjoys it enough, right? Yeah. So, so, but it's heavy. <laughs> yeah. It's a hard book to hold. I mean, and it is, you know, reading is, it's entertainment. It's something to, uh, something to while beat away back the, time. The, the boredom, yep. which they, there's which a lot they of all did. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and it also keeps them out of trouble, you know, that but yes, illicit pursuits. Most of the time. Uh, most of the time. Most of the time. That's sometimes the it, idea. Yeah, sometimes it could lead Al them to trouble. Although there are, you, you mentioned there was one soldier writing in hieroglyphics who was, you know, his reading materials were trouble, <laughs> or he felt so. The, the amorous adventures yeah, of Lola Montez. Lola Montez, and yes. uh, but so he was reading a pornography of the, the, you know, of the time, and but generally, you know, that's that's what you're doing. But there there are deeper reasons for why they were reading, uh, as you mentioned, and that's, you know, it's really it's soul building. It's it is soul restoring. It, it is a way to maintain some semblance of humanity, right? So um, I'm really bad on commandments, but one of them is thou shalt not kill. And for most that's Americans, an that's an important one, right? And that's what they knew. And war tells you, yeah. you have to kill. And even when the cause is just and you think the cause is right and you're fighting for all the reasons that you think, yeah. uh, you know, just warfare, uh, you still have to go kill. You, you might be called upon to kill someone. Most Right, that's your that's your job, um, and so reading is a way to maintain a sense of humanity. Um, connects you to characters, it connects you to your people back home, especially if you're rereading books that you had read before. Yeah, right. It, it's a way to it's a way to maintain that it, in, the, in the midst of conflict. It's it's 
personally, you're restoring yourself that psychological balance, and it's what you're fighting for. It's what, yeah. I mean, this is home it, that it, you're you're kind of reinventing that or building that back. That it's that reading is civilization. Reading is civilization, and, absolutely. And war is the absence of and, civilization. Yes. War, it, war yeah. is um, a failure of words. Y yes. Right. You go to war when words fail you, um, and so reading is sort of the perhaps an, an antidote, if you will, yeah. to, to that. It's a way to hang on, even when you know you're either engaged in, in something that you, you're not supposed to do, or you're giving witness to it, or you're hearing about it. It's around you, um, and so reading is a way to, to hang on to that. And it and references to reading. You know, I find this amazing, but it, they just dominate the letters you were talking about. And other historians have, you know, they, they look at the military movements that are recorded and what the soldiers were eating, the weather, whatever, you know, all these other aspects. But reading is so important, and it really, you know, shows how vital that was to, to their existence. Yeah, and I think, you know, some, some historians have, have, you know, noted, everyone knows, everyone knows, right? Hugo and Dickens mm -hmm. um, were popular. Lots of times they judge the, the readers by the quality of the literature that they're reading. And so um, we know it's become canonical. They don't. It's not. Dickens is not canonical in, mm. in the 1860s. Yeah. Dickens is a popular writer. It's like reading... Yeah you know, whatever whatever it is we're reading now. He's not in the canon yet. But so they're not reading it because it's highbrow literature. They're reading it because it's the new thing. Um, but historians have commented like, oh, he's got better taste, right? Or his his sure. his mind is more developed because he's reading this thing over here and not that thing over there. Um, and readers were not making those kinds of choices. If I were to come up with a Civil War syllabus based on readers, it would include Silas Marner and, and our mutual friend mm -hmm. and Great Expectations um, and Dinah Craig's Mistress and Maid. It would not include, um, it would not include Melville or, mm -hmm. um, you know, any yeah. of those other folks that we associate with the, with the Boston literati. Yeah. So yeah. it, would, it would look very different if we looked at then, war literature from the point of view of the people who were reading while in the midst of it. Then an American uh, literature survey today, right, right. looking you back, not. you would not, you know, it would look very different than, than what actual Americans were reading right. at, at that time. Another aspect is how, how real the, um, the literature seems to, to people, you know, struck like it. They, they're taking cues for their their real lives, oh, their yeah. their actions. It's yeah. you know it seems like uh, I, like reading Homer's Odyssey and saying, you know uh, the husband <laughs> right He's writing convinced to his, his yeah. wife right. be like Penelope be, be, not, be like Penelope even though her husband was gone for twenty years yeah. and she was getting old yes but the suitors were coming after her be like Penelope yeah um, another soldier he wrote home promising his mother that he would not be like Hamlet. He would be decisive in all of his actions. Mm -hmm. um, so there, yes, there are definitely things that they can, they can take away. One, um, the, I didn't talk about her, but it's a fiance. It's a woman who writes to her fiance. He's, he's, uh, he's in battle and, and uh, she had just re read an abolitionist novel. And the whole time their correspondence has been, I can't bear your absence, please come home. I, this is, you know, this is killing me. Yeah. And then she reads a, a novel called Peculiar Institution in which the mm. enslaved child is named Peculiar. It's an abolitionist li piece of literature. Wow. And she writes back and says, I have a better sense now of why you're fighting. And if you die for this cause, I might be able to bear it. So mm. you, you do see the way that reading influences. Yeah. A lot of times it confirms, but in this case it actually influences her. And then she sort of doubles back, like, I think I can bear it. You know, she's yeah. still conflicted, but it, she has a different understanding of why he's away from her yeah. when she so desperately wants him home. Yeah, it really is defining values. You, you can see it in the letters you're looking at. It's yep. defining values and it, how important the literature is and the reading in defining values uh, amidst all the chaos of the war. Yeah, you got to turn somewhere because yeah. you might not 
you don't <laughs> some of the the things that you see in war are actually the contradict right and the values that you that you hold so yeah and um, what um, you, you mentioned the it, one of the ways to really uh, demoralize the the soldiers and the population you know, burning libraries <laughs> you know which today we wouldn't you know there are no uh, no, our strategic target smart bombs don't go typically go after libraries anymore. But then. probably not. But you might think of, um, you know, I don't know. I'm not a historian of World War II, but I, you know, some mm -hmm. of those some of those bombing raids were less strategic in terms of military capacity as they were to, yeah, um, uh, in you know, sort of infrastructure of, of, and, and in intellectual institutions. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what would happen if. It, if, think of our response when Notre Dame burned. Oh, sure, absolutely. Right? So think of what yeah. would happen if, um, if, if, if a library of that magnitude um, mm -hmm. were to be destroyed, right? That would, yeah. that would cause at least the consternation for, for, some, yeah, yeah. for some of us to, mm -hmm. to, to, really, um, you know, to really think about, you know, my God, what are we, what are we doing? But yeah. yes, it was a, it was a strategy. Um, demoralize demoralize the, the enemy. Right, and that means all kinds of domestic yeah. institutions were up for grabs. And um, the like the I think you mentioned that the College of Charleston Library. Yeah, that was one. That was a, a soldier wrote home, and uh, he was a Confederate soldier, and he knew, right Sherman's on his on his way through the Carolinas, and he's one. He considers the greatest tragedy will be if the College of Charleston's library burns, yeah. um, and he knows of a family that's in the area, friends of the family, the Tutin family, and he says, "I heard, you know, if, if that private library goes up, uh, you know, what a waste." And there, William Gilmore Sims's library burned. Right there, are all mm, these cases of yeah. libraries being destroyed, and and you know, what a what a blow to the gut. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, it really was. It's like Notre Dame right. burnt. <laughs> burning, burning or down. something like you know I feel and I feel today there wouldn't be as you know we wouldn't see most people wouldn't right. see it as that it's more disposable but it really shows how how central yep. um, the libraries were yeah it's a it's a a library is a, and I often I sometimes use this phrase sort of jokingly but not really I mean there are temples to learning mm -hmm. right so um, and that's certainly what yeah. You look at some grand libraries, right? And they really are like temples to learning. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's how a lot of these folks thought about thought about books and reading, and a testament to our superior civilization. I can point you to this library. Yeah. That's what we're trying to do here. Yeah. That, right. That's, that's right. It's a Georgetown temple County to learning. Library but, yeah. System. Yep. Yep. Temple to learning. No, it, it, but it. Yeah, trying to. Not lose, you know. You were talking about soldiers trying to. They they were so worried about um, losing that their learning and their knowledge. They were, you know, trying to build back a course of study if they were in prison camp or even, you know, just out. That's right. Out Stay. Um, the the surgeon I talked about. Yeah. He was convinced his wife was having an affair. Also asked her to send his medical journals. Mm -hmm. His right his medical books because he can have scientific reading he, and yeah. he needed to keep up and it had nothing to do with being a surgeon in the army it had everything to do with he's imagining what his post-war yeah. practice would look like so he had just heard of this thing called like ether right and so mm. <laughs> you know he wow. wanted to keep up on keep up on all this stuff can you what can you imagine what a um, and this is kind of jumping historical periods but uh -huh. what would what would be an equivalent today to to what reading was back then the importance yeah, of it can that, you you know in world in world war one the everyman library sort of served that purpose in mm -hmm. world war ii both those aef um uh, editions of popular novels did that so did the portable series um that viking put out the portable hemingway the portable whatever those were all yeah. designed for soldiers initially and then they had to market it to a post-war audience my guess maybe um might be film um, because mm -hmm. you can, depending on where you are, you can stream it. Video games, maybe. Um, yeah. Although the, video games are, you could read about war in the Civil War, but most of the time they chose not to. I don't know if there are video games that aren't particularly, I'm not a gamer, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, but you can create community through video games, I know that. It is, Right, yeah. and so maybe video games is a way to, to be a part of a virtual 
community, just like readers are part of a virtual community of readers, even if they might not know each other, yeah. right? Because because everyone is reading the, the same thing. So, um, so maybe maybe video games. Yeah. And, and there is a creative aspect yeah. to that. We, you know, uh, although you mentioned how how what a creative uh, process reading is. You are you do you have to create that world as you're you're responding mm -hmm. to the words on the page, but you're also very vividly you know uh, inworlding them, creating them, uh, and inhabiting, responding to these right. characters, inventing the story, co-inventing the mm -hmm. storylines, and all that. So. Yep. You know, maybe, but the, you know, maybe film and, and gaming functions in a kind of a similar way. Yeah, uh, I had um, I sat next to a plane to a career army guy who who told me that one of his men. This was back when we still had those phone card cards that used to be used to make long distance calls, and they were out in Kuwait, and his, he phoned his wife, and she put in a disc of a movie and the VC or the thingy that plays <laughs> yeah. the thingy that plays movies and they talked about it over the phone yeah um, as a way to stay as a way to stay connected um, so other forms of media might take the place and my guess is it's probably streaming something assuming you have you know yeah. internet access and, and, and video games um, and games are played with other people in far flung places mm -hmm. so maybe Maybe that's it. Yeah. Well, you've done, you, you're a master of the archives. <laughs> and, you, I mean, you've been all over. You've gotten so, so many fellowships. It's difficult to mention all of the, them. This, this project, uh, uh, it, research sponsored by the NEH, National Endowment for the Humanities. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you do this kind of thing all the time. But what... Can you say what was your your best or favorite find in the archives for this project? Yeah, there's so many. I mean, that's that's a great thing. Every day, I think I found. You know, this is this is the find. Um, the one that I mentioned in my talk of the Union soldier who had read Solomon Northup and yeah. was marching through um, Louisiana, and he says, "I think this is the place where Solomon Northup was." And then he went and interviewed folks who knew Solomon, um, and eventually concludes that uh, and what he saw and what he heard was a thousand times worse than what Solomon Northup yeah. put in his diary. Um, you know, finding someone who checks out Frederick Douglass's My Bondage and My Freedom from a Library. So that means the library had to own a copy of it for that person to check out. Yeah. Um, you know, it was pretty remarkable. Also finding these lengthy passages the soldier I talked about today who was demoralized would send these long, long, long passages um, from Thackeray home. Um, he tried to read Milton. He, he was a Yale graduate. He had never read Milton, and he didn't read it in the Army. He just kept saying, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something, something better popped up. <laughs> and almost, and it, for him, anything was better than Milton. He couldn't read Milton, but he could read, but he read Thackeray, yeah. and he would write home these passages. So sometimes, even as he's attempting to grab on, as we heard from him, he just really feels adrift. Yeah. He really feels cut off. Yeah. Um, and it's all about try connection in Connect some because yep. in, in such a, it, amid the, you know, the, uh, the killing horror yep. and, you know, the, and the bloody mass of writhing humanity. Yep. That, um, the Hudson guy who's worried about the, the burning of the College of Charleston's mm -hmm. library writes home and he says, I think, he names a buddy and he says, I think we're just going to go build a cabin in the woods. Mm -hmm. We're just going to live, the, like my, my, my comrade and I are just going to, I don't, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Right, it doesn't, it doesn't end up that way, but at the time that certainly feels like the best answer. How on earth are you going to go home after yeah. this? And obviously reading was the way to kind of return home without, it, in the mentally. As best, as best one could, and you know, as best not, every, you could. not everyone is as damaged as, you know, yeah. as, as, some of these examples suggest some are able to reintegrate more easily than others. Um, but the the one thing I found that they all seem to share is is reading as one of the tools, one of the mechanisms to to do that. Um, do you feel that more Civil War reenactments <laughs> should feature a bunch of soldiers reading instead of fighting? <laughs> 
Yeah, so yeah. having never witnessed a Civil War oh, reenactment. Um, they're fun. Yeah. Uh, so sort of. if they're going to do, yeah, if they have, uh, but I do know, you know, I've read Tony Horowitz, so I know to some, yeah. some of the, the extremes that reenactors go, wearing the, the material, mm -hmm. right, so you can feel it. Um, which of course will feel different to us because we're used to soft spun cotton and they're not, yes. so you can't really recreate it. But if we're going to recreate it, they should all be in camp reading Mistress and Maid. Uh, Diamond yes. Creek, a lovely domestic yes. novel. Yeah. Or Dickens. Yes, or the Amorous Adventures. There's a, well, that one doesn't test. exist. That, That's right. There's, a, to... there's a like cleaned up kind of version wow. of it that was writ that was that's more of a, a travel log kind of thing. <laughs> but but the, the the actual book that he read, it, it, no one's been wow. able to no one's been able to find it. You can get the Lustful Turk online. Okay. And you might want to edit that part out, but um, yeah, it's. The, the title doesn't even come close to what, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that one's, okay. still, that one's still out there. Still available. <laughs> All right. I did not, like, for, just so we're clear. For better or for worse, <laughs> sounds like for worse. Um, for the true reenactment experience, there, you, it would be sitting in camp for days upon days, potentially. Yeah. Up until, reading. you know, toward the end of the war, and they writing. were like, you, would, you might go six months without engaging the enemy, yeah. right? I mean, there was like a period, it was like a season, Tedium. right? Like a season of fighting, right? And then yeah. when the weather turned bad and camp, you know, they would go back to their camps and you might be there for three months, four months, six months at a time. Yeah. And they would have libraries and stages. You had to do something in that in that time. Yeah. And it, so reading, reading was it. They did did some theater. And did some theater. Some music and, yep. and Shakespeare was a you know, big yeah, part yeah. of that. And, uh, yep. Yeah. It's a really... No, it's, it's fascinating. Um, All in a way to recreate that which you left behind. Mm -hmm. You were part of a choir or some Same. kind of musical group. You belonged to a literary society. You saw theater. You acted. You, yeah. you probably went to some form of religious services. So all of those things were recreated in camp, again, as part of a way to make sure that you remembered why you were fighting and that you could go home. Yeah. At the, end, at the end of the at the end of the day, uh, any any final words of wisdom for the good of the order today? <laughs> I have no words of wisdom. What what, what would be a word no. of wisdom? Uh, I I ask the questions here. You ask it's, the questions. They're not asked of you. It's in the stacks by the sea here. Thank you, uh, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah E. Gardner. Yes, the E is important. Lots of uh, Sarah Gardner's. Yes, there. that's that is true. I'm not on market. But they're not all distinguished university <laughs> professor right. of history at Mercer University. So we're very delighted that you were <laughs> able to come to join us here uh, in the stacks by the sea in South Carolina, Pauley's Island, Litchfield area, Georgetown County. But thank you and, <laughs> thank and you. come back and see us again. Um, we really appreciated having you here. And we will see you online at the Georgetown County Library YouTube channel, along with your presentation.